Welcome to the Civil War Digital Digest. I'm Will. Today, we're standing out in a cornfield. Uh, yep, that's what we're talking about, corn during the Civil War. And with me is a longtime friend of mine and uh, material culture historian, Brian James Egan, who's also an executive producer here at the Henry Ford in Dearborn, Michigan. Brian, thanks for hosting us today. Thanks for coming out, Will. So this corn doesn't look anything like I'm used to seeing as I drive in northern Michigan. That's, Tell me about where I'm at. That's right. What we have behind us is a field of corn that you would have seen in the mid to late 19th century and even early, uh, early 19th century. What you'll notice different about this from modern cornfields is the way it's planted. It's planted in a check row pattern. That is, if you think about a checkerboard, you would plant your corn, individual corn plants at the intersection of the lines. Great. I also see, not only I see there's a whole bunch more space here, so I assume the yield's a little bit less than a modern? The, the yield would be quite a bit different. The other unique thing about the cornfield of the 19th century is that it's a non-hybrid. So each of the corn plants themselves have its sort of own individual immune system. So they're all going to be varied in heights. There's going to be some tall, some short. Whereas a cornfield today, you drive past it through the highways, you're going to see all the same level uh, of height of corn. All the ears will be on the same side of the stalk, all at the same level. So if I saw corn today and I saw something like this and like that, that'd be a problem that would show either too wet or too dry in a specific area of the field. But and you're telling me that's okay here. Correct. In a modern cornfield, if you see variations, it's due to either standing water or too dry. Otherwise, if conditions, everything being equal, the corn is going to be perfectly the same, identical. Whereas in the 19th century, like I said, you're going to have varied heights, varied um, number of ears per stalk. Okay. And I see as I look down at each of these ends of the row for the checker, I see a handful of stalks of corn. Is this typical? Yes. Typically is what you would do. You'd have a hand jobber or corn planter such as this. It's a very simple device that you would have your corn kernels inside of this box. You would open it up, jab it into the ground, and when you close it, it would deposit three, four, maybe even six individual kernels of corn. So after they sprout, what you would do, go through and, and thin out saving behind your three, four, your best stalks of corn. Typically right after you would plant and they would start to, to sprout and come through the ground, emerge, you would plant field pumpkins right along with the, the hills of corn. And when the pumpkins would spread out, it would help choke out the weeds. Okay. And, help. and you'd have another crop to harvest here as well. That's right. And all of this is field corn. Most of the corn fields that you would see in the 19th century photographs, Civil War, uh, fields, the vast majority of them are field corn, and that's basic feed for animals. Okay, now how about the pumpkins? The pumpkins, the same thing too. These are not the type of pumpkins that you would be eating with pumpkin pie or, or any type of, of a dish for your table. These would be chopped up and fed to the pigs, to the cattle as well. So it's utilizing your field space for more than just one crop. Well, Brian, so we go ahead and we've planted the corn. It's coming up at different heights. How do you care for this during the season? The reason for planting in check row is the absence of herbicide and weed killers. So you need to, to manage the weeds that are going to grow. So planting in a check row pattern, you can take a single horse and cultivator, a walk behind cultivator, and cultivate up and down the rows, north, south, east and west, and even at a diagonal. So then what you have left is a perfectly cultivated area except for around the, the plants, the corn plants themselves. You would then uh, uh, simultaneously sort of plant your field pumpkins right along with it. So by the time that you, you couldn't cultivate anymore, you couldn't get a, a horse into your field, the field pumpkins have spread out enough to sort of shadow and choke out any remaining weeds. Brian, we've had a successful growing season, let's say, and it's time to bring this crop or this fielding because it's multiple crops. Tell me about how we do that. Farmers would have had two options. One, they could have shucked the corn right off the stalks, thrown it in a wagon, then brought the wagon up fill the corn crib with it. Uh, you would still cut the stalks down and stack them or, or gather them into a shock or a stook, um, and then you could have fed those out over the winter as, as fodder, uh, chop it up into small uh, pieces for cattle primarily to eat. The other way would have been to leave the, the ears of corn right on the stalks, cut the, the stalks, and then gather them into shocks. And then uh, the, the ears of corn would continue drying and maturing inside the protected layer of a corn uh, shock, if you will. And then the farmer over time, uh, throughout the fall, or maybe even into the winter, could have gathered individual shocks, brought them up, husked out the corn at the time, chopped it up, 
fed it directly to the cattle at that time. So it would have been stored right out in the field. And what about the pumpkins? The pumpkins would have been gathered at the time of cutting the, the stalks. Generally, you would have rolled them um, right up into a stock. It has that picturesque cornucopia look to them, but the pragmatic reason for that is you have uh, your animals, your horses pulling wagons. It's a gathering point for, for picking up later on. Well, I see you're holding another tool in your hand, and I assume this has to do with harvest. This, this does. This is considered or called a corn knife, and this implement here is a very simple implement, and a farmer would have taken one of these and gathered the stalks of corn and then cut through as low as possible, gathering the, the stalks in the arm. He would have stepped up to another hill or, or intersection of the lines, cut another. And when he had enough for an armful, he would have went to a, a location where they're gonna build the shock and then tip those together. And once you get enough to create your shock, you would have bound that all up into a nice uh, closed package, if you will. Okay. Well, our Civil War farm um, shocks are built for the year, but the knife gives us a transition. We see many officers and many soldiers who talk about cornfields during the war, especially fields like at Antietam being Correct. cut as close as with a knife. How do you transfer that? Today, people aren't connected with agriculture, so they don't quite understand when you hear, you know, the field was cut as close as with a knife. They're referring to a corn knife. They're not referring to a pocket knife. In a well harvested corn field, all the stubble, all the stalks are going to be three to four inches above the ground cut evenly because you want to maximize your feed for your animals, the, the fodder. So you're going to leave as much um, or as little behind as you can, as much for your animals. So, so in the case of combat, when a, re when a story comes out like that, we're talking complete devastation of a field. Absolutely, it would be completely leveled. All of corn would have been cut basically three or four inches above the ground. And for somebody who hasn't walked through a field like this, talk to me about, you and I have done documentary work together, talk to me about what it's like to move a body of troops through a field like this compared to a modern cornfield. Well, with the check row pattern corn, it's gonna be much more open. Although you're going to have varied heights of corn, you're going to be able to see the troops moving through. They're going to be able to see a little bit further ahead. In the 19th century, in a Civil War uh, situation like this, all of the, the formations, all the movements are basically linear um, or yet an oblique. It's almost textbook perfect for a, a, a check row pattern cornfield because you're marching your men up and down, north, south, east and west, or even at a bleak, and it, it lays its, it lends itself perfectly to that. So just like cultivating this crop, moving mm -hmm. troops through a uh, period check row pattern cornfield is very simple. Absolutely. I mean, you would have still been hung up by the nature of it being f uh, lush and green, and you would have had the other secondary crops of pumpkins and maybe climbing beans in the way, but certainly you would have been able to navigate through a check row pattern cornfield a little easier than a modern straight linear cornfield. Well, Brian, thank you for hosting us and thanks for being with us today. Thank you for watching this episode of the Civil War Digital Digest. We hope you got something out of it. If you've enjoyed the episode, we'd appreciate it if you'd hit like and subscribe to the Civil War Digital Digest. We'll see you next time.